Jim Morningstar, thank you so much. It is an absolute pleasure. I'm so excited to be sitting down with you now. And uh, we're going to be talking about some very special breath today. But I wonder if you could kick us off <laughs> with a little bit of an introduction about who you are. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mike. First of all, it's, it's such a pleasure to have this space to share something that's so dear to my heart. I was trained as a clinical psychologist, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but I didn't really find my vocation until breathwork came along, and it took me over. <laughs> uh, I was kind of cheeky back in those days, and I was learning all sorts of new things. This was in the 1970s, and, and I said offhandedly, well, this breathwork is great, you know, but probably in a couple of months, I'll be on to other things, and well, that was like 1976, and I have not found the height and the depth of breath work yet. Uh, I've combined it with my work as a counselor, as a therapist, as a teacher, and now as a, as a trainer uh, over the past decades. And it's not something when I say that it takes over, I don't mean that's the only thing that one does is breath work one has to breathe all the time to be alive, but breath work infuses an extra quality of consciousness into one's every activity, whether it be their profession, the work that they're doing, their daily life, their family life, their meditation. So I would call this the talk today, if I might, Mike, I would call it the evolution of modern breathwork. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Great title. We, because even Leonard Orr himself didn't say, uh, who was one of the founders of modern breathwork, didn't say he invented it. He said he rediscovered it because breathwork has been used for millennia by traditions in China, Tibet, India for health, well being, emotional stabilization, mental clarity, and spiritual enlightenment. So, in a sense, it's, it's not something totally new under the sun. What we've done in the modern world, however, is we've added the neurological and scientific understanding of the function and optimization of breathing, along with the democratization, if you will, of facilitation skills, such as it's now practiced on such a widespread scale in almost all, well, most of the countries of the world. So, I mean, we know common sense, breath is foundational to our life. Just how we nurture ourselves, how we metabolize, all the way to how we have peak performance as humans. So for myself, being raised in a relatively emotionally suppressive atmosphere of the 1950s, it was athletics was the venue in which I could really express myself put myself out more emotionally. Back in the day, there was even the terms of uh, the have kill shots and uh, smash the enemy, you know. <laughs> All the, uh, I think the violence of humanity uh, was channeled and buffered into athletics. It still is, actually. How do we put our aggressive energy into something that isn't really destructive of the human body or other human bodies, but actually brings the best out in us? And you got to breathe. We, uh, in athletics, uh, we used to call it having wind. So a person might, you know, start out running down the field and halfway down, or, <laughs> well, they didn't have wind. They, they didn't know how to breathe. So it was important in any, almost any athletic endeavor, uh, maybe except chess, or, but, but to, know how to breathe and sustain breath uh, so that you have endurance. 
that was a background for me when I went to school and I knew that I wanted to be in some sort of a helping profession. I felt called, actually I was thinking, you know, it should be engineering because I could do mathematics, but that didn't really call me. And I thought, no, psychology, yeah, that's something that has scientific aspect to it, but also the care for people. And that was the decision going into college. So I uh, studied psychology uh, here in the Midwest, uh, Marquette University. But uh, after a while, I, academia was a bit much. I just had to, uh, so I went to, and lived in France for a year and did schooling there and traveled, hitchhiked all around Europe. And that to me filled in the part of education <laughs> that sitting in a classroom and regurgitating things from a book uh, didn't fill in. Actual contact with a variety of people. Uh, hitchhiking, <laughs> you really do meet a variety of people. So I came back and I then went to graduate school and had a, a actually it was a very good graduate program. It was uh, in clinical psychology at Fordham University in New York. And it was fairly humanistic. Like, for example, uh, the first thing that we did was they took us to Bronx State Hospital and they said, now, here's a person you hang out with and you cannot diagnose them. You cannot judge them. You just hang out and be with that person. Tell me what you think and what you feel. And some people wanted to be smart right away and get in there. Well, I think this person's different. No, no, no diagnosis, just what do you experience in being with the person? I thought, wow, this is great. And I went into community psychology. And uh, so I did my internship at St. Elizabeth's in Washington, DC. And again, what a variety of people and being sent out into communities uh, that were racially embattled at the time, you know, as a quotes expert. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I was a kindergartner in terms of learning how to navigate in community life. And then I came back uh, to the Midwest and actually before I came back to the Midwest, I finished my PhD in clinical psychology and I said, I've had it and enough of the talking head I am not gonna sit in a room and just talk all day to people about their problems. I have to get back in my body, get back to earth. So two days after my defending my PhD thesis, which was on working with suicidal people, I and my wife hopped on a plane, went to Africa. I said, I'm either gonna to have to go to Africa and get back to roots of humanity or go into full-time psychoanalysis. Fortunately, I chose going to Africa. <laughs> and in the desert, uh, Sahara uh, desert, it's like bong enlightenment came. And that is, I really had to get back to earth. Forget the psychology business, uh, go back. We came back to the Midwest, we planted gardens, we got our fingernails dirty, we, we were breathing with the earth, so to speak. And of course, we were headed to West Coast because that's where it was happening. That's where life was burgeoning and new consciousness was developing. Unfortunately, we brought back some hitchhikers ourselves from the uh, African experience and uh, we had a little amoebic dysentery, something. So we got stationed right here in the Midwest. And I went back and took a psycho community psychology job uh, in the interim to uh, create some income. But it's then when I began to discover a whole different way to approach helping humans. And this was the days when Gestalt therapy and bioenergetics was uh, coming to the fore. And I needed that for myself. So 
I, especially Alexander's Lowen's bioenergetics was spoke to me. I mean, in my the fiber of my being, and Alexander Lowen knew a lot about breathing. He knew that if a person was just analyzing their problems in their head, they weren't going to make changes. The changes that stayed in them were incorporated. And so we did things like being on a breathing stool, opening up our chest, learning how to breathe deeply and to vocalize, to let feelings come out. Then I said, now this is what I'm willing to learn and teach. This puts me back in my body. And this is, I'm willing to follow this as a vocation. And I did. And uh, learned other body techniques. Uh, we took Tai Chi. Um, uh, tai Chi was newly brought over by Professor, Professor Chen Man Cheng from the East. He had a mission to bring this over to the United States. And he had a school in New York City. And one of his main teachers, Fred Lehrman, we heard about and brought to Milwaukee, uh, where we were living and still live. And he taught Tai Chi classes. Now, Fred was a very open systems person. And he, at that time, heard about rebirthing with Leonard Orr. And he tried it, he got into it, and he said, I recommend this. I think uh, you should bring rebirthing to Milwaukee. Well, just at that time, my wife and I had purchased our first house. We had never had a house. We had moved uh, nine times in two years. <laughs> Things were in boxes. Time to settle down because we had a child. Uh, we had lived in a spiritual community. We had been on enlightenment intensives. We had, we had been on a spiritual path before. But now we got this house and we said, well, we can justify having this much space because we will dedicate part of the house to visiting spiritual teachers. And uh, so it worked out perfectly. The rebirthers who came to our house at that time, uh, first certified rebirthers, uh, did sessions here in our third floor. And amazing, amazing the aliveness that it brought into my body and awareness into my consciousness. And I said, I want to follow this. This is something I want to learn and be able to share with the world. Well, I had already been doing bioenergetic classes. And so I, I went to my regular Monday evening bioenergetic class. And one of the women in the class all of a sudden fell to the floor and started breathing fast. Uh, what, what's going on here? This is breathing just like I was doing it in a breathwork session. So I either have to tell her to stop doing that or to coach her to breathe like I was coached in a breathing session, which I did, of course. <laughs> and so I became an instant rebirther <laughs> right there, uh, de facto. And I said, well, okay, that was great, but I, I've got to learn more about this from people who've had more experience. So we learned that Leonard Orr was having a uh, rebirthing training in New Orleans, and I believe this was about 1975. And so the whole family on an airplane, two children, my wife and I, fly to New Orleans during Mardi Gras. <laughs> and it was uh, truly a circus, <laughs> everything going on. But Leonard Orr was so welcoming. Uh, he wasn't a person that's like, oh, get those children out of here. We're doing serious work. No, children are invited in. Uh, it, it was a, a true blessing uh, to see and to experience what a group of people who were dedicated to doing breath work 
felt like. Uh, again, the more I got into it, the more I was hooked by it. Uh, so I decided I have to go to every breathwork training I can and learn this so I have some skills uh, to share with other people. And again, that's, that's what we did. I went to some trainings myself. I had a one training experience with one of the then certified rebirthers with a man who just operated his whole life intuitively. He raised himself in abandoned cars in New York City and didn't go past the third grade, but he taught himself music, art, you know, it is, uh, and I had one issue with rebirthing at that time. And that is that I would get into it, I'd get into a session and I'd stop breathing. <laughs> well, now that, that's an issue with, with breath work, huh? It's like I would go into what's called checking out. I would uh, breathe for a while and try to, try to be a good uh, rebirthy, try to do it right, feel the energy. But all of a sudden, I would seem to get very sleepy and monk. And I had the best rebirthers in the world, literally, at that time. None of them could help me to stay awake, except this Bobby Birdsell guy, who I went to the training. I was the only one in the training. <laughs> <laughs> he did things very offhandedly uh, in you know, Waterbury, Connecticut. And uh, <clears throat> he got most of his uh, clients from bars and uh, on the street or wherever. Uh, but he just loved breath work and loved teaching it. And uh, so he brought me to his house and he says, okay, uh, we'll start with a session. Uh, lay down there uh, in the living room. Uh, I'm and uh, start your breathing. I'm going to uh, go have lunch. What? So he <laughs> he went to lunch. He, Are you breathing in there? You know, it's like this is not professional. What? And intuitively, he knew the ticket to keep me breathing, which was. I would check out on my anger. Whenever I'd get to uh, the experience of frustration or anger, I would check out because in my family, we didn't have anger. I mean, of course there was anger, but it was suppressed. And so there was sarcasm, there was being clever, but there was not a direct expression or even an experience that you could label, oh, that's anger. And it pissed me off. This guy isn't even paying any attention to me. He isn't in there trying to keep me awake. <laughs> and so I stayed awake. And I learned something critical at that time is that we have to give permission for our emotional body to come out as we breathe. In fact, my personal view is that this planet is a place that people come to deal with their emotional bodies because we've got great physical capabilities, wonderful mental capabilities, even high spiritual involvement, but it's in the emotional arena that our, our, our hose is crimped. And so learning to identify and breathe with feelings became my torch to carry in breath work. And it worked in so beautifully with the bioenergetics that I had learned. Because Alexander Lowen, who was married to a physical therapist, <laughs> and so he knew about movement. He knew about expression, not just verbal, but with the body. And so I began to incorporate for people who, like me, had checked out on their feelings, ways to enervate themselves and to 
get the flow of breathing going in their bodies with the use of movement, vocalization, expression of emotion. And I still do that. As a matter of fact, I'll go into it a little later. Uh, I took a lot more of what Alexander Lowen and his brilliance learned about the developmental stages of people and how each of these challenges at developmental stages are either integrated or not. And they become the stuck points for people throughout their life. Well, back to Leonard. Uh, Leonard uh, went through his journey of breath uh, back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, first of all, as I said that I did with a spiritual awakening, he awoke and in high school and college um, had introduction to uh, charismatic religion and having experiences of uh, religious, religious uh, spiritual awakening. And he knew that that was a keystone uh, to his life. But he was also carrying the baggage that humans carry with them from his own birth. He recognized through when he got into learning how to breathe, and he spent many, many years in a bathtub breathing. He, he learned about his own in utero experience, the first bathtub that he was in, that his mother had three children and she was done. She did not want to have any more children. But she ended up having three more, he being the last one. And he said, coming into life, he was very excited. This is great to be incorporated in body. But he picked up that emotional charge of his mother not wanting him, being depressed at his presence. And in his metaphorical way, uh, he said, he wanted to check out even before birth. His umbilical cord was wrapped three times around his neck. And the doctor had to bring him out, cut the cord, push him back in, turn him around and bring him out. So his transition, his birth trauma, was pretty great. And in the course of the years, uh, let's see, I think he said it was uh, uh, 1962 to 1974, when he was doing all this breathing, he unraveled that birth trauma. But in the course of doing that, there were several years when he replayed that su those suicidal tendencies for a couple of years, uh, he said 65 to 67, he had these recurring suicidal impulses. He stuck with the process, thank God. He breathed through it. And coming out the other side, uh, he led a relatively healthy and happy life. And he had bouts with cancer and other things, all of which he learned to get beyond. I think anyone who is a healer also goes through their own healing crises and so doing lives with the confidence that this can be overcome. Not that I read it in a book or I heard about someone that did it, but I experienced this in my own body. I experienced the power of the breath and the mind working together. So he was born in Walton, New York. And as he began to uh, teach uh, what he called um, spiritual psychology seminars, because he learned a lot from Thomas Troward and others, he left the strictly Christian tradition because of the confines that were put on in terms of traditional religion. He knew that this had to be something for all the people, not dictated about 
what they can believe and how they can believe it and how they can practice it. And he knew it had something to do with his experiences of breathing in the bathtub. Now, his association was that you had to be in water and breathe in order to have these insights and this evolution. And so in San Francisco, uh, he and a group of people that he had taught this breathing to, he would sit there with people by the bathtub and help them, coach them through the breathing. Because he said everyone would reach a point. He said, uh, when he first taught this, he said, well, get in the bathtub, bathtub and let yourself breathe until you get to the point where you feel like enough, I got to get out of here. Then stay and breathe some more. What? Yes, it's getting past that experience of flight that you, you can't take this anymore. You, you just got to get out of here and your mind will make up an excuse. Uh, um, uh, I got to make dinner or I got or whatever it is. No, he said, no, stay through that. Let yourself breathe through that experience. And he would stay with people next to their bathtub <laughs> as they breathed until they got past it. And all of a sudden, they didn't have that panic anymore. All of a sudden, they were starting to get insights about their life and implement changes in their life. He says, ah, we are onto something here. So on to California, where there's a lot of free thinking people and uh, get hot tubs. <laughs> and so they, uh, he and a uh, number of people uh, purchased a house, um, I think it was on Lyon Street in, uh, I don't know, I remember that, in uh, San Francisco, and they called it Theta House. Now, I just learned this yesterday because I was uh, reading about it. Uh, it was called Theta House because Theta was the state of brain waves of complete calmness and, and bliss and, and, and deep sleep. And Leonard thought that was the goal of being able to maintain that state of calmness uh, throughout your life. So in Theta House, uh, they had wet breath work, they had the hot tub, people would breathe, and uh, it, it was a regular process. Now, something that Leonard realized from the onset that he later on said many people didn't give credit to and, and got lost along the way, was that just breathing and waking up was not enough to change your life. You needed community. You needed association with like-spirited, like-minded people who would support the changes that you were putting into your life. Because when you change belief systems, uh, you don't always get a lot of support from the community around you. And in the beginning, to really institute these changes and incorporate them in your body, it's good to be in a community where people are having these out-of-body experiences, all of the things that can happen in breath work, uh, non-ordinary consciousness, as Stan Groff calls it, that would happen. And rather than getting taken off to a mental institution, People can help you learn the meaning of it, breathe through it, and expand the boundaries of your playground, what is fair game for you to be aware of and grow in life. And so Leonard, from the start, instituted what he called one-year seminars. And this was a group of people that committed to be together for one year and they met from uh, once a month from 10 in the morning till 10 in the evening and immersed themselves in spiritual practice and spiritual teaching. And then they would do rebirthing sessions in between that. So this one year seminar program was vital to the spread of breath work. Having spiritual community was vital for breath work to actually 
be incorporated into people's lives and their lifestyle. And this first one year seminar group uh, of 80 people actually then pooled their money and bought a breathwork center in the Sierra Nevadas, Campbell's Hot Springs, as it was called. And so the first sessions were done in Walton, New York. Then there was Theta House in San Francisco. And now the third center was in Campbell's Hot Springs. And again, people lived there, people taught there, People from all over the country came there to get breathwork training. I, of course, was gung-ho on all of this business. And I went to the, the, the large yearly gatherings where you could become a certified rebirther, as it was called at the time. And uh, you had to have taken trainings, you had to be able to facilitate other people in breath work, but you also had to be able to stand up in front of the entire assembly, could be a hundred people, and say, I am a certified breath work, uh, re rebirther as it was called at the time. If one person object, nope, you're done, sit down. Oh, <laughs> and at that time, since when I went to the, my uh, second one and I was proposing myself as a candidate to be a certified rebirther, uh, at that time, there were 10 people who were already certified and gone through that process. And you had to get the signatures of those 10 people as well as the approval of everyone at the Jubilee, as it was called at that time. Well, I got the signatures of nine of the 10 people. No, I wasn't shot down by anyone in the group. And I didn't get the signature of the 10th certified uh, rebirther. She was holding out. She wasn't quite sure. Perfect for me, perfect. I had to, as Leonard said, you're only certified by yourself. <laughs> you can only, and you have to certify yourself first. So all of my doubts, all of my fears, oh, I went to all this trouble, I expense of bringing the whole family out here, even flying a babysitter out here with us to take care of the kids while we were doing this. And oh, you know, and oh, the ignominy of not being chosen. Oh, I had to go through all of that stuff. As I sat there in the final ceremony before they announced who the new certified rebirthers were that year, I breathed and I got clear. No, this doesn't dissuade me one iota from what I'm called to do. I will continue to teach and learn breath work, it is my calling. I looked up and the final person nodded her head, said, you got it. <laughs> How dramatic. <laughs> and, so, and so I was pronounced a uh, certified rebirther at that time. And I believe there was, I, I think I remember Bob Mandel, Lima Beth Starr, myself and Jack Shazama. So there might've been four or of us that year that were past the certified breath workers. Okay, great. Back to doing breath work with people, doing more training, learning more. Because the, the, the real teacher here is the spirit of breath. The real teacher for breath workers is their clients. If, I used to say, God is outside the door sending your next teacher in, in the form of a rebirthy. And, and it's true. If you think you know it all and you're just trying to impose it on someone else, you're doing them a disservice. It's a journey that you're engaging in together, energetically, spiritually, physically. 
And so I went back the next year to the yearly gathering of, and people at this point, I mean, this was spreading like wildfire. This was 1977, 1978. People were coming from all over the world had heard about this. Amazing. And Leonard was tireless. Leonard traveled continuously. He was going from country to country, uh, teaching people, getting them set up so that they could teach. Uh, he was like Johnny Appleseed of breathwork. <laughs> uh, um, amazing uh, courage. Uh, uh, that he demonstrated in carrying this around the world. So people would then come from around the world. Um, and this one was in Colorado, I believe. Um, but a number of uh, the certified rebirthers at the time recognized something's wrong with this picture. We got people getting on airplanes coming from Russia, coming from all over. And we're going to get maybe one or to four at the most people certified. Mm. This seems to be slowing down something that wants to blossom. And we rebelled. <laughs> it's like a, as good breath workers, we, we learn that you've got to continually break form break, not lockstep along. And so we wrote a proposal called a proposal for excellence in which we decided that this process of certifying people was starting to get too inbred. It's like you got to get the signatures of everyone that was certified before and anyone off the street could come to the training and say, you're out of here. This was not serving the cause of the spirit of breath. And so we rebelled from the process and said that we wouldn't participate in it. We wanted to open it up, make it more democratic, more egalitarian. More, you know, and that was the beginning of the dysporsia, so to speak. The, uh, I think there was only one more jubilee after that. And a couple of people were certified, but that was it. And because the major contingent of people who were certified at that time said, we're not gonna carry this mantle ourselves. We want more people to be certified around the world. And that's what happened. The, the movement then spread and people were developing their own ways of teaching, learning, teaching breath work. Myriads of schools were developed and the creativity and the uh, joyousness of breath now really caught fire. Mike <laughs> gave me this wonderful stage to present all of this on, which I'm so grateful for. And he also said that I could tell people about the recent things that are happening in our school, which is uh, something that's relatively new that I've developed over the past several years which is online and in-person breathwork training combined. And I've done online and in-person things for you know, evenings or day long, but this is an intensive training that we're doing the 16th through the 20th of August this year, which is a hybrid, which there will be people from the virtual world who will be there getting virtual training by teachers working with them, as well as teachers in the space of a beautiful, beautiful retreat center, which we have completely to ourselves. And so the energy of bringing these two worlds together has magnified, I would say exponentially increased the energy available for people during this training. So uh, I invite you all to have contact with us at transformationsusa.com, transformations with an S, USA.com. And also 
look at the years of trainings that I have recorded and edited and are available for people to take at their own rate and at their own pace, which is also can be incorporated into being in our uh, part of our certification program. In other words, you can take in-person things and you can take some online things and virtual classes. So there's many ways to learn because there's also many ways to teach this. And people are learning <laughs> some of the people who have been doing in-person breathwork for years is, oh, we can't do this online stuff. Oh, this is not real. This is not real. Now what's real is essential connection. And what we've discovered and what Mike here is promoting is that we can connect essentially with one another, whether it's through the internet or what I call the internet, <laughs> our inner connection with one another. Those can be combined. We can learn and grow together. And it's not just an interesting theory. We've done it. We did this last year, yeah, completely online, with no in-person. This year, we're doing it online and in person at the same time. Jim, I want to say a personal thank you for giving up your time uh, and for telling us that story completely because it's uh, yeah it's a fascinating story about the evolution of modern breath work and uh, it's been it's been a real honour and pleasure to 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 be a a member of the audience to sit here and listen to that story. So thank you so much for everything you've done and you continue to do uh, and hope we'll be able to get you back on the podcast again at some point in the near future. It would be totally my honour, Mike. Thank you for the work that you're doing. You are disseminating uh, the seeds of this throughout the world. And uh, that's really an important part of uh, supporting the spirit of breath on our planet. Well, well, thank well, you. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you guys. Till next time. See you all. Everyone take care. Bye-bye. Cheers.